So um, hello and welcome everybody to um, the .edu special interest group. Um, I'm Diane Mueller. I am the Director of Community Development at Red Hat for OpenShift and the OpenShift ecosystem. Um, and today we have with us our new chair for the EDU special interest group, um, Stephen Braswell from UNC Chapel Hill, who was voluntold or coerced into chairing um, the SIG. So um, we're, we're really pleased to have him with us. Um, we have a bunch of other folks um, who are on the mailing list, on the main mailing list for uh, OpenShift, um, a lot of other EDUs besides um, UNC. Um, these are just a few of the ones who accepted today's invitation to talk. Um, at Red Hat, we uh, have Linux and all kinds of other products and lots of other um, EDU situations, but really we're trying to focus um, this specific interest group on things like OpenShift, the container ecosystem, um, scaling things in the cloud, and how that all applies to um, .edu. And so that's kind of um, why I'm trying to gather all of this. We've had, I've had lots of conversations in the community around um, with EDUs, and so I thought it would be timely to um, get you together before you all go on vacations, though I think a lot of folks have gone on vacation. Um, so we have set up a mailing list. Um, one of the things I'm going to ask you to think about is whether um, you like to use or are willing to use or able to use Slack um, or are um, avid users of IRC um, in different ways that we can communicate with each other. And that's kind of what um, I'm trying to figure out how, what the best way to engage in these conversations um, will be. And so that would be helpful to know for me. But for today's um, agenda, what um, we're thinking we're going to do together, um, and you can change the mission and the goals of this as you want as the EDU folks, um, is to discuss and develop and disseminate best practices um, for administering, managing, and operating OpenShift in an EDU setting. I find that can mean lots of things, you know, whether you're using it for hosting your university's um, web infrastructure or you're using it in the classroom setting. There's lots of different things I've heard of people doing. Um, if you want to join um, or you want your peers at your university to join, um, there's a, a web page set up here with the URL for the SIG off of the common site. And um, we've, um, as I said, coerced Stephen Braswell at UNC um, to chair this, um, this session. And so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and let Stephen talk a little bit about his experience. Because <clears throat> my university days are long behind me, um, but I'm very grateful um, to have Stephen here with us. And so Stephen, if you want to share your screen. Hi, hi everyone. Um, I'm Stephen with the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, I want to talk about uh, two basic things today. Uh, give an overview of what uh, we've done with OpenShift at uh, UNC, and then uh, talk about uh, just some ideas that that we have here for the EDU SIG. And then um, I'll hand it back over to Diane, and she'll talk about other ideas that uh, she's come up with as well. So first, a little bit about me. Um, I've been working at for a little more than 16 years. I work in our middleware services group, um, which is in the central IT group. Um, some of the things that we do is we manage basically applications infrastructure. We're historically system administrator type people. So we still work some with systems, but we have a separate uh, group that manages the operating system and hardware level for us. And we manage basically everything above that um, for the applications. Um, that includes um, Sakai for learning management, OpenShift. Uh, we have a big uh, WordPress installation or two big WordPress installations for content management. We still have uh, legacy Apache web servers that host uh, various uh, static content and programmatic content for end users at the university. Um, we host a large number of job applications. Some of them are custom applications for departments. Uh, that are housed in Tomcat. Um, we have JBoss for some applications that specifically are supported on JBoss. And then we still have uh, use Glassfish for some custom, uh, basically uh, ERP-like systems. They're things that, even though we implemented PeopleSoft, they're functionality that PeopleSoft doesn't do. 
that's custom to the university. So we have job applications that are dedicated for that. We also run our log, log aggregation system. We use Splunk for that. Um, we have applica application performance monitoring tools. Um, we manage collaboration tools for the university. Um, we just recently took on um, helping manage reporting systems. And a lot of other uh, bas basically web-based services that get thrown our way. Um, so uh, our group does a lot uh, for uh, central IT, and so but OpenShift is only part of that. Um, are you still only seeing the one slide? If we didn't go to the next slide. Okay, let me just do it this way then. All right. Um, so one of the things that um, my group. Uh, really tries to do is is uh, help with the evolution of IT. So outside of uh, universities, uh, people are growing um, with the industry. Universities um, can be a little slow, um, particularly we're a, a state government entity, so um, we move a little slower since uh, our funding depends on on the state funding. Um, so we've been we've been evaluating the okay, what do you run on bare metal? What do you run on VMs? And these days, what um, is more appropriate for running in containers. Um, and we're trying to lead that here at uh, UNC Chapel Hill. And that includes things like implementing OpenShift for PaaS, uh, working on tools like Puppet and Ansible for automation, and so on and so on. Um, so that's, that's one of the reasons that uh, we're really big into pushing OpenShift is uh, we're trying to um, get things moving forward. We used to be a... Uh, our organization used to be pretty good at keeping up with technology, and we've been a little slow lately, and we're trying to help uh, push that forward again. Very slow to advance here, so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll figure it out next time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we branded our uh, OpenShift uh, implementation as Carolina Cloud Apps. Um, we're using OpenShift Enterprise version 2, which got renamed to the container platform. Um, we have a self-service uh, sign-up tool uh, so that people uh, go and sign up for the service. Uh, the primary reason for that was uh, we wanted to lock down the namespace to their university user ID. And um, there was an, e an easy built-in way to do that with uh, version 2 of OpenShift. Uh, so we wrote it, we locked off uh, people being able to create their own accounts and they have to go through our tool to sign up. So that was just a, a namespace thing. We do provide it free for everyone at the university. Um, we're not charging for it um, at this point. We don't foresee charging for it um, anytime. Um, and then we essentially manage the infrastructure uh, and the uh, shift uh, software uh, for the users. Um, some of the benefits we saw was uh, the the basics of OS management, the operating system, the 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 uh, programming languages, databases, all of that we we uh, manage that for them, and then they don't have to, so they can focus on developing their code. Whether they're a student doing it for a class, a professional programmer doing it uh, for the business of the university, or someone just wanting to uh, learn a programming language. Um, we also had instances where someone might be just hosting a web server just to run some PHP code and and they bought a desktop machine and they're running under their desk, um, but it wasn't getting patched. So we had the vulnerability issues. Um, we didn't want, we wanted to provide a mechanism so that people aren't doing that anymore. We also have some internal consolidation needs. Um, as I mentioned before, we have a lot of Java application servers. And um, one of the things we saw was we could consolidate that onto the OpenShift platform. Right now we run all those on separate VMs and they're clusters of, of uh, departments and, and other units. So multiple applications might live in the same Java container. That makes uh, uh, tuning the JVM very difficult because all the applications have different needs. If we could uh, put those out some in containers, uh, particularly in, in version three of OpenShift, uh, we could tune those better and then uh, provide some autonomy for the developers to, to manage some of the restarts and, and such that they might need for the applications. Um, we also didn't really have a easy way for uh, LAMP functionality. 
basically if you wanted that, uh, we had a group that provided you with a virtual machine, but then you had to manage everything yourself from the operating system, the programming languages, everything, patching. You had to manage all that yourselves. And uh, um, particularly for uh, students, that wasn't provided for students anyway, and we wanted to provide uh, functionality, that kind of functionality, um, but make it easier for people. Um, we also test, had some departments, that even for just simple services like uh, Drupal, they would uh, uh, work with an off-campus vendor, and that vendor would host it for them or provide some other kind of services. We wanted to keep that uh, spending on campus, and even though we provide the service for free, you know, that's an incentive for them to to not go and spend it off campus, and then uh, all of the programming and uh, content resources uh, stay on our campus network. And we also have some legacy web servers. Um, we use AFS uh, still for a, a, a file system um, that people put their static HTML code, programming languages and such. Um, we had some projects where we were trying to uh, move people away from that decommissioning. And um, this was a, a way to, to uh, work on that. Um, our initial rollout was in October 2014. At first we had created uh, we'd set it up so that only individuals uh, would get space in OpenShift. Um, after we did that, we realized, oh, well, that's we're still back in the old mentality of, of that's tied to that particular user. If that user was a grad student or an employee that left the university, it's still tied to them. And uh, uh, changing ownership of that was a little hard, particularly since the namespace was tied to their uh, user ID. And then that was in turn tied uh, into DNS. Um, so to uh, uh, work with the departments and other project needs, we create a separate uh, OpenShift environment um, just for departments and projects. And what we did there is we created uh, a fake user ID that wouldn't um, conflict with the university IDs that basically owns the, the uh, namespace, e even if there's only one application um, in the namespace. Uh, we did that so that it's not tied to an individual. You can set up uh, access controls and such, and then uh, provides a mechanism for the collaboration stuff to be to be easier. Um, we fronted the hardware and software costs for three years, uh, so that we could we have so that we had time to work on um, getting it implemented, um, getting people used to using the system without having to worry about okay, it's it's been year one. We need to. We need to fund it again. Um, and then uh, one of the things that uh, Red Hat helped us with was we did a training session of about 40 something people. Um, that was an interesting learning experience trying to get all these people uh, um, on the same page. We, we start started from scratch where basically they uh, we work with them to uh, install Git on their machine if it didn't already exist and then going through setting up um, uh, a sample application that we had developed and setting up an app, a database and breaking it and then showing them how to fix and stuff. Um, for the most part, it was a good idea. Um, probably could have, probably should have done it with a smaller group of people. Um, what we've done instead is uh, we'll go out and work with uh, departments and groups one-on-one uh, -on -one, um, and reevaluate whether a training session is a, is a good idea in the future. Um, one other bit that's not on this slide is uh, we started our proof of concept roughly around December 2013, January 2014, and um, worked on that for a couple months. We were ready to uh, actually go live um, between August and September of that year, but we had some other major projects um, that were, were going to go live at the same time, and we were asked to delay. So we were ready to start a little bit earlier, but just um, um, didn't have the opportunity to. Um, for anyone who's already uh, deploying up a shift on site, um, and then that's the other thing that I, I, I briefly uh, skimmed over for is we are running it on premise. Um, it is basic architecture. Like I said before, we had the individual space, and then we set up a departmental one. Um, under the departmental section, you'll see uh, some boxes labeled sensitive. Um, one of the things that we want to do is be able to offer sensitive data, which I'll talk about a little bit later, uh, where the HIPAA and uh, FERPA and, and data like that. Um, we sh and just so that we didn't need to duplicate it, we share support nodes, which is our DNS server, um, our MongoDB and ActiveMQ for OpenShift. 
Um, our campus DNS server doesn't have API access for us, so we're running our own and, and pushing the updates up to that. Uh, we had some expected use cases for the uh, project. Uh, we expected people to do both production and non-production applications, um, particularly around PHP, and we were hoping Java. Um, uh, we, we'll see in some stats I'll put in later that uh, primarily uh, large PHP users um, for the OpenShift. Um, I mentioned the legacy AFS space and our old web servers. We have lots of programmatic content there, and we're hoping people would use the system to, to migrate the data or migrate those applications from the old system into this, where uh, it's a little more modern and they have a little more control and, and information like logs and stuff where they don't have access to that today. Um, I mentioned that we have a big WordPress installation where we provide a multi-site WordPress for users to uh, set up websites um, with a common set of plugins and themes. Um, we do have, they do run into some problems where a department may want a plugin or theme specifically for a professor that uh, no one else wants to use. So for the, the shared environment, uh, the team that manages that says, well, we're not gonna install that. Uh, so we expect that people would wanna run their own WordPresses, their own Drupals, and use their own versions of plugins and such. And uh, OpenShift would be a place for them to do that. So there's still campus resources, they don't have to manage the VMs and such. Um, we are a university, so we uh, expected a lot of learning capabilities and usage for the system, um, particularly around learning a new language. So if you're a PHP programmer and you want to learn Python or Ruby, um, it would give you an opportunity to do that, or to just sandbox applications for a proof of concept to either if it's a student, a professor, or if, it's a, if you're working in a department, you're a, setting, a designing application to show uh, um, something that they may want to use for uh, to replace an existing application without having to, uh, again, get a separate VM or do it only locally in VirtualBox or, or some mechanism like that. And we also expected, since we ha do have a computer science uh, department, uh, classroom uses, particularly there, um, and that hasn't, uh, there hasn't been as much use of that yet. There is interest, interest once we get to, uh, OpenShift version three, uh, where we are working with a computer science professor who's interested in, in using um, IPython, Jupyter, uh, to do some classroom stuff there. And so we're um, working off and on with him on his needs there. So Stephen, we have um, uh, IPython bit of a guru in Graham Dumpleton. So hopefully we can do a session on that and, and bring that some of his expertise in on that. He's got some good connections in that community. Yeah, I talked to Graham at Summit, and uh, and we uh, and he's very very willing to to help me with uh, the upon the Jupiter stuff. What I needed to do was have a subsequent meeting with the professor to gather some more information about how the professor wanted to use it, and then um, Graham could uh, better uh, write up a a use case for me and how to deploy that in V3. Awesome. Um, some notable use cases, we had, we had the ones we expected, and here's some that were people who actually used the platform. Um, one of them is we worked with a professor who had some students developing um, some mobile applications for him. So that, I think the professor was in some biology department. So basically the mobile application allowed uh, like high school students or uh, middle school students to go out into the field, um, you know, they're just out on a field trip. And they'll use the mobile application to uh, uh, identify bugs and the plants that they're on and such. Um, while that's running actually on the Android devices, the API for that and the backend database was, was running on OpenShift. Um, we're really happy to work with them on that and um, um, continue to work with them. And they seem to be very happy with the platform. We have someone that wrote some kind of uh, uh, psychology, um, blind study, no sensitive data there, um, an application to, to handle that. People using it for digital signage, so the back end uh, displays for uh, for the content of the digital signs, um, they're, they're using that, the uh, OpenShift for that. Again, I mentioned about the WordPress stuff, uh, people are using, uh, putting up 
their own uh, department websites and various either CMSs, either WordPress or Drupal. Some of them we didn't even know and, until we started seeing uh, traffic coming in. So that was kind of great. Um, we worked with a um, researcher uh, who was um, writing a virology web application um, that the application would actually be hosted on OpenShift, but then it would interact with our research computing cluster through an API and um, submit um, jobs, get information about jobs and such. Um, and then our help desk, which uh, uh, we call the service desk, is uh, moving a lot of their internal applications for like looking at call volume, looking at uh, um, other help desk related statistics. I don't remember all of their applications at this point. Um, they've been moving so many. Uh, moving those from uh, VMs that, that have been hosted for them into our platform. And um, they're particularly interested uh, once we, uh, if we ever get into evaluating the new .NET functionality. Um, they have some .NET applications that they run on Windows servers and they're very simple. So that there's no reason they, they couldn't run them on OpenShift um, in the future. And we hope to work with them on that. Um, some very basic statistics. Um, we're almost to 1,100 users on the system, um, 468 years. The most popular are PHP and MySQL. Um, oddly, the, one of the other top cartridges for our V2 deployment was cron. So a lot of people doing scheduling um, in their applications as well. So that's kind of nice. Uh, I've, I've hinted before about uh, sensitive data. So currently, our Information Security Office hasn't approved our OpenShift version two for sensitive data, um, and we really and we've been working with them for a little over a year to do that. Uh, it's not technical challenges of the platform; it's more uh, policy on our end. We we're trying to be uh, play nice and ask them for permission to be able to host sensitive data, or not every um, group at the university you know talks to them first; they talk to them later. So we talked to them first, and so we got more down and, and them deciding that they needed to flesh out a little more of the policy. Um, we've been working with them on, on remediating any issues that they have with the platform. Again, it was never really with OpenShift. It was about policy of you know, how are you doing backups, how are you doing log management and aggregation and such, and things like that. Uh, so we've been working with them to get that. Uh, we're very close to that finally. And um, once, and we have a lot of people, a lot of uh, departments, particularly, who want to host things that ho that have sent HIPAA data, and uh, we expect that once that's approved, uh, the numbers will dramatically start increasing on our usage. We've been stalled a little bit uh, at this point, um, but we expect that'll uh, dramatically increase. Um, some of the challenges we had was um, historically we were behind the scenes um, group where we managed the system, but we didn't actually directly deal with um, campus customers. We directly, we typically dealt with uh, other IT people, um, mostly in within our own department and a, little, a few in other departments. This is our first one, um, direct, directory, directing, directly interacting with uh, customers and helping them out, getting their applications deployed and such. Um, so that was a challenge for us. Um, um, as many of you who work at the university know, uh, you have varying people who might be using uh, the system. So there might be an administrative person in an office uh, just doing some things with WordPress. It might be a student. It might be a seasoned developer. Um, so the varying ranges of, of technical skills uh, and, and helping those people uh, was initially a, a challenge for us. Um, which kind of goes along with the, the next one of customer documentation. While Red Hat had great documentation on using the OpenShift platform, we wanted to have some custom documentation for our, our implementation and um, uh, write the documentation as such that it would cover everyone from their varying technical skills. So that um, while we understand you need to have some technical knowledge to use the platform, um, we provide the commands that you would need to run to do the basic operations. And then, for example, if it's WordPress, they could just interact with the WordPress interface after that. Uh, for a lot of our developers, they are particularly our uh, uh, professional developers, um, they were big uh, subversion users. So there's the workflow change for them to use Git since they had, they um, weren't big into, necessarily big into 
the open source world, so they hadn't had a lot of familiarity with Git, and we still have some challenges with that today. And then the workflow of of, uh, of pushing it into Git and then it automatically getting deployed, um, that was just a challenge for some of our customers that we had to work with. And so we really wanted people to start using the platform, so marketing was a big challenge for us. Um, I'll show on the next slide that we, um, we worked with our communications office to uh, get the word out. We had the training session. Um, we put up posters. We had stickers made. Um, and then uh, we weren't active in Twitter for anything related to our uh, group. So um, getting the word out there, particularly um, on changes to the platform, patching and such, you know, is, is ways to notify uh, customers about changes. Um, that, that was a big thing for us. Um, the, we created a developer liaisons um, program, which is just people uh, in my group who will go out and work with customers one-on-one. -on -one. Um, usually it's been uh, student groups that are helping a, a professor or uh, departmental programmers, helping them get uh, used to the way the platform works. Again, the developer workflow changes that we mentioned, and um, that's been really successful. Um, uh, another challenge is the container versus VM, when to, when to use OpenShift versus you might need your own full virtual machine. Well, that might sound simple to a lot of us. Um, we were working with our uh, team that runs our virtual management platform and, and uh, make sure that we're all on the same page so that when we give our disparate presentations around campus, we can um, uh, correctly direct people to which they might which, uh, whether they need a container, whether they need a VM, particularly, obviously, uh, high memory, high CPU applications, um, you prefer on a, v on a virtual machine. And then um, another challenge that continues uh, today is application backups. So while we do system level backups for disaster recovery reasons, uh, we documented that our uh, customers needed to do their own application backups using the commands um, in the RHC tool for OpenShift. Um, and there's also the challenge of our one-time backups, our, our system-wide backups um, aren't going to capture but a point-in-time database backup, which may not be in a consistent state uh, if it needs to be restored. Um, so that's been an ongoing challenge for us is how to do that, how, how are we going to do that, handle that in the future. And, um, and work with our customers on that. As I mentioned before, we had marketing, so we had posters, stickers, some little business cards, and we went a little overboard with the pillow. We don't give the pillows away, they're just one that's in my boss's office. But uh, again, uh, um, we really wanted to get people to use the system, so you know, telling people it's there, telling people it's free, and um, um, getting the word out. So what are we looking at for the future? Again, the sensitive data thing I mentioned. Um, we're close to getting approval for OpenShift version two. Then we'll have to start the process over with version three. We don't expect that process to take quite as long. Um, but again, it, since version three is a rewrite, um, our information security office will need to reevaluate uh, some of the things that they did for version two. Uh, the biggest thing for the future is moving to uh, uh, OpenShift version three. Um, We've been working. We have a proof of concept for that. We don't have. We haven't set up our production um, platform yet, and uh, um, that's that's one of the biggest things around OpenShift that we're working on these days. Uh, I mentioned before the the Glassfish, the Tomcats, uh, the job applications. We'd love to move those into OpenShift version three, particularly so that individual applications have their own individual containers. The JVMs can be tuned for those applications. The developers can stop and restart the applications themselves without having to involve us, things like that. Um, we toyed around with the idea of putting Sakai in OpenShift. Um, I mean, that's, uh, we haven't even talked to our learning management team about that. Um, it's just an idea that we have um, that we'd like to do because, again, it's, it's a Java application, so it, it could fall into the, the same uh, category as our other ones. Can you talk about uh, when you talk about Sakai, um, I'm just talking in the chat between the learning management system for folks who don't know that, um, and I didn't. Um, is it 
when you talk about beginning the evaluation and putting it in OpenShift, are you talking about perhaps taking on containerizing it? Yes. So uh, um, it's, it just runs in Tomcat, um, and and we're actually um, have a project working on the new version that's going to be in Tomcat 8. Um, so basically just putting it into a container. We probably still host the database for it on a uh, outside of OpenShift on a on for our uh, database uh, team would manage that. Um, but yeah, just taking uh, the Tomcat install and the application code and putting that into a container and running that up in, on OpenShift and being able to, particularly during say um, exam periods, uh, easily scaling that up without having to get a full virtual machine. That would be really nice for us to be able to do. And, and even for other applications where, okay, during student registration, um, we're getting hit a lot. So we'll temporarily scale things up to twice as many containers. And then once that's over, we'll scale them back down and and not having to have um, full operating system instances would be really nice for those cases. Mm -hmm. um, another thing, uh, at Summit, uh, we saw a presentation by uh, someone at Duke University who's just down the road from us about how they uh, took their multi-site WordPress and containerized it where everyone, instead of being part of the same multi-site, gets their own container um, of WordPress, and then they can kind of do what they want. Um, that was an interesting idea, and, and we'll eventually talk to them. They aren't using OpenShift to join it with native Docker containers, and we would look like to do that with OpenShift. Our digital services team um, already creates uh, a UNC branded theme and has their set of plugins that they prefer that we might would create uh, an image that has that is like UNC ready uh, for our customers to use um, if they didn't want to use the, uh, the shared platform or if we decided to split the shared platform up a lot more. Um, I mean, that's these are just ideas uh, that we've been tossing around. In version three, uh, the, uh, there's a log aggregation tool that comes in. Um, the Elk stack just using FluentD instead of Logstash. We've heavily invested in Splunk. Um, so big thing for us is getting the logs to go to both so that customers inside the system can use EFK to look at their logs. But we get a copy that goes to Splunk for our information security office to look at, particularly for uh, departmental applications and, and uh, sensitive data applications. Um, we didn't do F5 load balance integration in version two, and uh, we'd like to do that in version three. Uh, there were some challenges in version two because you had to have some administrative access. Well, you still have to have some of that administrative access in version three, but we worked with our networking team who manages the load balancer, and um, we have a solution for that. Um, I actually have some uh, ideas about how, so basically the, you have to have just short of root access on the load balancer to, to implement to integrate it, and um, it's actually a limitation by F5 that I hope to submit a um, RFE to have them make a change. And then you still need some privilege access, but you wouldn't have to have as much privilege. And I want to talk to the OpenShift team about some potential workarounds um, based on some information I gathered from F5 around that. Um, with uh, OpenShift version three, we get a right to run license for cloud forms just for OpenShift uh, in, uh, statistics uh, management and such. So we're uh, evaluating, uh, or we have that installed and, and uh, working with Red Hat to uh, look at cloud forms for other things. But the in the new version of cloud forms with the self-service capabilities and then the uh, chargeback showback abilities for uh, for containers and such. Um, that would be interesting for us to have that data. Um, even though we don't charge for the system, it'd be nice to be able to uh, um, have that kind of accounting. And then evaluation of mobile platforms. Um, we've uh, Again, uh, we've worked with uh, Red Hat on a, on a hosted proof of concept for Red Hat Mobile. And then with the new Red Hat Mobile, you can host um, some components of it on site. We're not a Red Hat Mobile customer, um, but we are evaluating the product just to see uh, um, if there's interest in it for our campus. So um, if we did end up purchasing it, we'd probably host it on our OpenShift platform. So Stephen, the, the um, Insect Taxonomy mobile app that you talked about a while back, um, what did they develop that in? Uh, 
I, I think they just did it in like Android Studio. Um, I remember it's an Android only app, so I don't think they used any kind of uh, uh, framework that I'm aware of. Or we didn't get into the specifics since they weren't hosting the application on OpenShift, so I don't know the details of that. So with uh, version three comes new challenges. Um, we don't have a lot of, we haven't had a lot of familiarity with um, Kubernetes or Docker, so we have to get familiar, a little more familiar with that. Um, we do have some people around campus, some of the more savvy developers and professors who have done some things with Docker, so they know a little more and we've talked to them and such. Um, so that's big, that'll be a big challenge for us is, is getting used to that and um, passing that information along to our customers. With OpenShift version two, uh, the, the hosted Git repository basically came built in. In version three, we need to host one. Um, again, we were subversion shop, so uh, uh, having to set that up um, was something new that we had to do. Um, but it did uh, help us uh, push to have uh, developers um, start talking to developers about maybe migrating their existing subversion repositories, even for applications that aren't hosted, will, that won't be hosted on Shift. Um, into a Git repository. The V2 to V3 migration is going to be the big thing. Um, um, we've been working with Red Hat again. Um, we're not far from the Red Hat uh, main office, so uh, um, we do get the um, value add of being able to work with them closely since they're nearby. And um, we've gotten some information about some initial guides on uh, migrating applications. Um, we we're hoping that. Um, to learn from what they do for OpenShift Online, that they have millions of applications who are hundreds, um, and uh, figuring that out is just um, going to be our biggest challenge. Uh, more documentation. So uh, we wrote a lot of documentation for the V2. Um, there's even more stuff, particularly with teaching people some basic things about Git um, and the additions of components with uh, Docker and Kubernetes means that there are just more things we need to tell people about. So we'll write more documentation about that. Version two, we created a, some basic shibboleth integration for just a few languages. Um, figuring that out for version three has been a challenge, and um, that's one thing that uh, we're still working on. With uh, Docker troubleshooting customer applications and why they didn't deploy correctly. Um, we already see that that's going to be a challenge. So we do it with our very simple applications, um, and we don't have uh, good ideas on that yet. Um, if others do, we'd be happy to, to hear them. Um, version three's uh, new technology challenges. Um, we were told by an engineer at Red Hat that we we've clicked some buttons that other people haven't, and so we find some bugs that they haven't. Um, so just getting used to the new technology and, and version three, is, again, goes back to even the familiarity with Docker and Kubernetes um, that uh, uh, we're trying to get through. Again, application backups. Um, there's not an automatic tool like there was in V2. Since you have persistent storage volumes, the backups for those are supposed to suffice, and we need to just figure out a policy around that, uh, procedures, et cetera, so we can tell our customers. Um, and, and finally, I just want to go through a few ideas that we have for the EDU SIG, and then um, I'll hand it over to, to Diane for um, taking on for what she has. Um, biggest thing for us is we're very open with uh, sharing information. We we'll, would we'll tell you everything that we about our environment, the pain points that we've had. Uh, we'll share the very bad tools we wrote, you know, things like that. Um, we're hoping that others will be the same way for their implementations because, you know, for-profit companies and EDUs operate very differently. And we're uh, a uh, state government-based um, public university, so we have some challenges that maybe private universities don't. Um, so they need that kind of open information sharing. Uh, documentation, again, we wrote a lot of internal documentation. Um, we've given that to universities. We're happy to give it to other universities. Um, we have ideas about maybe coming up with some format with Markdown and storing it in Git, and then you can substitute, you know, our university name for your university name. I don't know. Um, those are just ideas that we have. 
we could create a v3 like, migration strategies again we're still in the early stages of that and if other people are going through the same pain we'd love to share the information or hear from them uh, monitoring ideas uh, for version two we took a lot of uh, red hat's uh, operations team um, put a lot of their zabbix monitoring on github um, and shared some other information with us and so uh, we did a lot of that for v2 and just getting ideas about monitoring for v3 whether from the infrastructure side or helping customers if they want to do service level monitoring logging that i mentioned before um, other universities can just use the elk efk stack that comes built in in v3 or they, do they have their own are they splunk shop do you want to send to both or do you use something else we're interested in hearing about that the cloud forms usage um, again we're just starting our evaluation of of the right to use cloud forms and the data we can get out of it um, if other people are more actively using it or even if they're doing something with the managed iq upstream and that we could figure out the the similar feature that'd be great and then cost model again we're offering the service for free to our um, campus if you're doing it for fee um, we'd be interested in hearing about that and, and why you're doing that um, or if you're also doing it for free, great. Um, or you only doing it for free for part of your community. Um, again, it's we're up in the information sharing so that we can look at our ideas and say, okay, maybe the way we did it wasn't right and the way that um, these other universities are doing is a better idea than what we did. And then there's our contact information. Um, the email address is, is for everyone on our Cloud Apps team. Um, and then our website just shows is just more of a, a marketing thing and our sign up tool and then we try to be active on twitter um we're not as active as you'd like to be but those are ways that you can contact us and uh, as always you can contact us through diane as well and that's all i have i'm gonna stop sharing so that diane can do her slides well i'm also gonna um ask um People can unmute themselves. They should all be. Um, you'll see a, a microphone with a, a red slash through it. If it's black, you should be able to talk. Um, you might get a little bit of an echo. I think that's one of the problems with uh, blue jeans sometimes. But um, thank you very much um, for sharing all that information. Would love to see uh, maybe a .edu SIG repo on GitHub where we could share some of the documentation and maybe that's something we can set up. I'm gonna share um, my screen here just to drive a little bit more of the conversation because um, I, I have questions for you. Um, the first question I have is, um, well, I should ask, do you wanna continue meeting as a SIG? And um, if so, how often um, would you like to, to meet? Um, I have a time slot um, in mind, Wednesday mornings, this time, um, uh, Pacific, I'm on the West Coast, so that's noon Eastern. Maybe it's your lunch break is what I'm hoping. Um, and I know most everybody has a an August holiday plan, especially folks in EDU. Um, so um, could, uh, you know, a few of you voice your opinions here. We have um, Maybe in the chat, if you don't feel like talking out loud, John Wang or Gabriel or Chris or Patrick or Stephen, does this time work for you guys? Um, so th this is Chris from the University of Michigan. Uh, yeah, this time I think would generally work for us. This is noon, so it's our lunch break, and uh, Wednesdays tend to be a uh, eating light day, relatively speaking. Uh, monthly seems like a good frequency for these meetings, at least to start with. Yeah. And then if there it seems like there's uh, more content or less, then we can adjust from there. But monthly seems like a good initial frequency. Yeah, so that's that's kind of and, and that's what I was thinking. And I think maybe not the first week of um, September, the second week, which I think would be the 16th, if I've got my calendar figured out here. Um, I think that's probably the, the it's either the 16th or the 17th. Mm -hmm. um, in 2017, it will be the 14th. Um, so I, I'm, that's what I was going to propose because that'll give you a week to get, I don't know how your schools start, but that'll get you through the first week of Labor Day and everything. Um, but that was what I was thinking. Any objections to that if we do the next one on that? 
All right. And I'm just going to move to the next slide. Um, uh, I'd love to know who you are um, or who, how you self-identify. Um, and maybe if I spelled administrators right, you'd admit you were an administrator. And yes, plus one for the 14th. So Chris, what is your role at um, uh, UMesh? So I'm sitting here with uh, two other guys. I am a business analyst with our teaching and learning group. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the guys on my right and left, Dave and Mark, are both system administrators. There's a, a fourth person that's part of our virtual project team who is uh, analogous to what uh, the, the way that Stephen described himself. He's also a system administrator, but more working with client-focused uh, applications as opposed to uh, underlying systems. Okay. I'm about Gabriel and um, the other folks? that are on this call. Not that I'm picking on you, Thomas, or? Hi, this is Thomas. Yes, and I'm also from the University of Michigan. I'm actually from the College of Engineering, and I'm an application developer in our web services group. Perfect. Um, so that's good. And I can see a couple other folks, but they've got themselves muted, so they're probably in places where they can't talk. But I will bop back here. and so. Um, I've also created a mailing list for this, so I'll send the same questions out to the mailing list. Um, there were a number of topics that um, Stephen suggested. Um, I was just sort of taking some notes while we we're going through there. Um, it, you know, I, I'd probably like to, now that I remember the, that Duke did that presentation on multi-site, WordPerfect, that, that might be a good topic too. Um, Things do not have to be exactly OpenShift specific, in, in my humble opinion. I don't know how you all feel about that, but if it's things like Git fundamentals or um, Containers 101, um, we do a, we, there is another SIG for image builders, and so we can pull some of the content from that um, and talk about that. Um, I was hoping the, the folks from um, Boston University would come um, sometime soon and talk about um, their mass open cloud initiative too. Um, which is a bigger, big, bigger than what you're doing with Carolina Cloud Apps, um, which is specific to your university, but this is about sharing across um, different Massachusetts-based um, um, educational organizations, and I'm, I'm kind of curious to hear about it. But um, Chris, I'm, I'm wondering if um, on the next one, on the 14th, if you could talk a little bit about what's going on at UMich. Would that be... Um, a good thing, or is there a specific topic that everybody's dying for, like um, the elk or the should be the elf or the EFK um, stack or something like that? Is is this kind of use case sharing good, or are there things that you'd like to deep dive on? Those are the kinds of things we can talk amongst them on the mailing list as well. But uh, if you have opinions about that, that would be helpful. But if I can peg you, Chris, for the 14th, that would be great too. Uh, yeah, that that would be just fine. Okay, so we'll do something similar to this, and I will keep reaching out and, and bring your other colleagues too. Um, and I will add all of your names to the mailing list. And anyone who's listening to this after the effect, um, after um, after that, you can go to um, this page here that's on the screen, um, the hashtag interest section of the OpenShift Commons page, and pick. Um, the EDU one and sign up for the EDU mailing list, and that will get you on there. Um, we're going to try and... a couple of things that I think come to mind for me in terms of things to talk about. I guess I'd be interested to hear if the other people on the line, other people on the line, are uh, interested in these as well. But one is, you know, the model that people are using to uh, provide OpenShift to their customer base. You know, is it is it pure DevOps? Um, is it more standard operations? Is it is it something in between, or is it a development group? So you know who who is it that's administering OpenShift and how they are working with their customers? Are they using it to move to more of a DevOps model, or is it more of a traditional model? Um, so that's one. And the second thing is, is there kind of common interest in some of the um, enhancement requests? So if there are uh, common enhancement requests across uh, multiple schools on the SIG, uh, that might be, Diane, uh, useful information for you, and I, I think probably for all of us uh, to provide to a Red Hat that it's not just an individual enhancement request, but there are 
uh, multiple schools that might be behind some of the requests that uh, we might be making. Yeah, so the other thing that, that springs to my mind too is to talk about um, the, the Trello cards that we have for driving enhancement requests and you know how to do a thumbs up or sign on to one of them. Um, that probably be handy for people who haven't done that yet. Um, and how to add a, a Trello card, which is if there is a common one that can rise up. And that is really one of the reasons why I'm doing this EDU SIG is so that you guys have a voice um, and, and make that make those kinds of um, uh, collaborative pushes on um, the folks the actual people who are writing the code and contributing to OpenShift, OpenShift Origin. So that's that's all good. I also think that we can um, we can do things like a survey about your question about what models people are doing on the mailing list too. Um, that is a long-standing one and ask people those questions and then to describe their um, their their model and how they're using it and maybe the evolution of that and then coalesce that information uh, into a presentation. Um, where people just talk about that and what's more effective for them and why. And that, that's These are all great things. Um, I think once a month it will work very nicely so that we don't do anything. Um, and what I'm going to encourage you all is to ask all of those questions of each other on the mailing list. And um, you should get invites to the mailing list, I think, by tomorrow morning. Um, I will add everyone who was invited to this session, and um, if there's anyone else at your um, organization, so you miss you have like two or three other folks in the room, um, just send me their email addresses or send them to Stephen, and we can add them to the mailing list. So is there anything else anyone would like to add? Because we've just about used up your entire hour, and I really want to thank you for um, for joining us today. Um, you never know when you when you kick off a SIG whether tons of people are going to show up and it's just really nice to, to have all of you here sharing these um, your best practices at UNC and your experiences and to hear from you all. So um, thanks and I will talk to you all on the mailing list soon. Is there anything you would like to add there? Um, I'll stop sharing my screen. Stephen, I think you've got yourself on mute. Uh, no, uh, thanks everyone for coming out and listening to me ramble on for almost an hour. <laughs> Rambling thanks. is good. Thanks for sharing your experience, Stephen. All right. Yes, very much. Thank you. All right. Take care, guys.